Eu nunca falei no microfone num lugar tão pequeno né, como esse daqui, mas tem que falar. Boa noite a todos. I will speak in English, of course, because you know they will speak in English, so I understand you all speak English. And uh, I welcome you here. Uh, my name is Sergio Branco. I am one of the directors of ITS. And it's a pleasure to have you here to listen to our fellows. Uh, some of them, some spoke yesterday, some are speaking today, and some are sick, and they are not coming. But the ones who are not, they were here yesterday, and three of them are here. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to have such qualified uh, people coming from many countries to be here, to study here, to talk to us, to, to teach us, and also I hope to learn something from us. And today we'll have um, three people, three fellows speaking. First, we'll start with Gemma, and uh, then Florian, and finally Karima. Uh, Gemma is from Spain, and Florian and Karima, they are both French, but they are currently studying in Canada. So, do you think 20 minutes is okay for each of you? Yeah? So each of them will talk for 20 minutes and after this one hour we will open for uh, discuss questions and answers and debates, okay? Thank you, I hope you enjoy. Gemma. Thank you. This is weird. I wish I didn't have to use a microphone because it kind of makes this like creates a bit separation, but I'll try to forget about it and I hope that you do the same thing. Um, to start, it was really hard to pick a topic. Um, um, it was mentioned yesterday how we all wear several hats and I definitely wear several hats. One of the options for today was to talk about my experience as responsible for technology and privacy in Podemos, but I thought that this is probably better off as a conversation, so I'm around. If anyone has questions about Podemos, we can address them. And I thought there's another part of what I do, which is my work, um, where I could configure or give you a, um, a perspective on, on privacy in Europe that you probably haven't heard, that you probably don't have. And I thought that was going to be more useful, so I've chosen to do that. And I want to talk about privacy by disaster. I don't know if you've heard about privacy by design, very um, hot words, starting in Canada. <laughs> uh, now in Europe, it's PVD as well, this privacy by disaster. And, my argument is that what's made Europe separate itself from the rest of the world in terms of privacy, the reason why we care more about privacy than other regions, is not because we're different, it's not a cultural matter, it's not a historical matter, it has a lot to do with the impact that privacy disasters have had on policy making, on the industry and on citizens. But let me start with a question. In the last few years, who do you think did most to raise awareness about privacy? I give you three options. Edward Snowden, this lovely woman in the middle, is, who is, sir, is Taylor Swift? Jennifer Lawrence. Okay, Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so out of touch with that culture. Taylor Swift's about trademarks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't even remember, she had her photos of so many um, well-known people stolen from the iCloud and put on um, um, given away for free in several uh, social media repositories. And they were not ordinary photos. This is the question. Yeah. They were not ordinary. Exactly. They were, they they were specific. They were private but, pictures that yeah. she had taken of herself, kept uh, them in what she thought was a secure place, the iCloud, and then um, saw her account being hacked and the pictures being not only sold, because that's what usually happens, they're sold on the deep web and no one finds out, but this actually made it to the open web and co caused a bit of a stir. And the third picture um, is, is a, is a, a mock-up of full-body scanners that were, begin, that were introduced in Europe in, in 2010. So in the audience here, what do you think, out of these three options, who do you think did most to raise awareness about privacy? How many of you think that it was Edward Snowden? <laughs> okay. Who do you think it was, this lovely woman? Okay, pretty much the same. Who do you think it was, full-body scanners? <laughs> okay. What is interesting is that all the, all the answers are correct. They just speak about different audiences. So usually an audience full of activists will talk about Edward Snowden. 
a normal audience with non-specialized people will say pop icon. That's when I realized that there was something wrong with what I do with my pictures and my private material. And very few people will say full body scanners. Where for me, for what I work on, the, the case of the full body scanners changed policy in Europe for ever, I hope, <laughs> or at least for the, like, for the last five years. I'll tell you what happened with the full, the, with, um, full body scanners. In December of 2010, a guy boarded a plane in Nigeria, um, got off in Amsterdam and then boarded another plane to go to Detroit. He tried to set on fire the plane and have something explode. You might remember that case. He only managed to explode um, his own underwear. That's a picture of the underwear. <laughs> Um, I don't even remember that case. It was like after 9-11. It was, it was the closest thing to 9-11, nine years after 9-11. So it was a massive outcry. Oh my God, here it goes again. Planes are not secure. We need more means to secure um, our population, blah, 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 blah. So then after days went by, we started to hear what happened. And so we learned that this man was actually in a watch list, both by the... Um, UK authorities and by the American authorities because his own father had reported him for connections with Al-Qaeda. The problem is, no one did anything. So his father reported him, he ended up in a watch list, but no one investigated further, so he couldn't go up to a no-fly list because no one investigated. But he couldn't be removed from that list either. So if he had been completely innocent, if he, his dad had just reported him for family um, reasons, he would have been put in that list uh, wrongfully. That was not the case, but because no one investigated, he didn't go up to a no-fly list. That would have made us all more secure, because we would have identified someone who was on the path to radicalization. That did not happen. So if you ask a policy analyst that, like me, that's what I am, what's the solution to this problem? How do we make sure that dangerous people do not board planes? Well, by putting more money into traditional police investigations, by making sure that no one is in a watch list unless there's an investigation about that person. That we don't have watch lists where, where basically 20% of the population are somewhat controlled, but not really. And we hear that a lot. People that end up committing acts of terror that were previously watched, the, the, the French guys in the Charlie Hebdo um, attack, had been under surveillance until six months before the, um, the attack, they had, the surveillance had been, had been discontinued because of problems of resources. So if you ask me what problem do we have, the problem is that we have people in this world that do want to harm others, what solution do you find more police resources going, going to traditional um, policing activities? What was the response of the world and of the EU? Full body scanners. And you see that over and over again in security policy. The relationship between the problem and the solution is non-existent. We look for technological fixes. We have a problem. We look at the solution does not imply anything flashy, does not imply buying new devices, implies better policy making, better policing. But politicians want something that is flashy, something that can be seen, something that can make it to the cover of a magazine. And technology does that. Technology sells. So when EU officials were posed with a uh, responsibility to respond to the population before that, they said, we need something that calls people's, people's attention, something that is visible to security. And so they, they enacted the security theater that we often um, condemn from the, from, the, from the point of view of policy analysis. So we had a problem and we had a weird solution. And there was a huge outcry against full body scanners. I don't know how much it got here, but it was pretty amazing both in, the, in, in Europe and in the US. People refused to go through the full body scanners. There were no studies about how they might impact on health. People felt that they did not want to be seen naked by the, by the bodyguards. Images of naked people going through body scanners ended up on YouTube. So it was quite obvious there were security leaks happening, even though they had promised that that was not going to be the case. So basically, people did not accept full body scanners. And somehow, this fact in 2010 opened what we call a window of, a window of opportunity. All of a sudden, EU officials realized that if they continued to do policy in this way, they were going to face a massive acceptability problem and that people were not going to be happy about their policies. The industry realized that if they put lots of money into new technological developments, then people were not willing 
to make part of their daily lives. They would lose a lot of money. No company makes money with a pilot. Companies make pilots at a loss, and then they hope to sell them in large numbers. With the full body scanners, they only manage to sell the pilots. And the citizen, we realize that if we say, no, that's not okay, we might get things removed. So in the end, full body scanners were removed from most of the um, airports in the EU, and where they still um, are in use, you have an opt-out mechanism. So you can say, I do not want to go through the full body scanner. That was not the case in 2011 when they were first introduced. So this gathering of uh, willingness to change things between authorities, the public, and the industry meant that things began to change at the EU level. And one thing that happened after then is that the money that the EU puts into R&D in Europe, and we're talking about 70,000 million euros in the next seven years, cannot go into funding new technologies unless someone is making sure that the ethical, legal, and social impact of that technology is studied before the technology goes out in the, in the open. So massive change. That was in 2010 that this started. We had this debate 2011, 2012, when the Commission um, um, asked for some reports by experts and stuff. But of course, things have had, had happened before, and things continue to happen later. That's an image from one of the first controversies that we had around smart artifacts. These are, that's um, a smart meter. I don't know if you have that. In, in Brazil, in Europe, they have to be installed. They have to substitute the old meters to count the electricity in your home to make sure that you get the, the bill. Um, by 2018, in Europe, all households need to have this smart meter. They were first introduced in the Netherlands in 2005, and consumers associations got together and said, we're not happy about this. Because guess what? If in the Second World War, we had had smart meters, Anne Frank, this is the house of Anne Frank, would not have lasted two days. Because a smart meter can identify where you are in the house, what you are plugging in. So they can derive information on your living habits, on how many square meters your house has, has your house has, based on the, um, on the electricity that you use. So it's a massive invasion of privacy. If someone wanted to spy you through your smart meter, they could. And there was no mention to that in the EU regulation that is pushing for smart meters in the homes. And so in the Netherlands they managed to stop it and right now they had to change the whole software of the smart meters and right now the meters are opt-in or opt-out and the intervals at which they read your information is not a continuous thing but basically you can decide whether you want the smart meter to read your information every hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes, every day, etc, etc, etc. So they won some battles in that respect and that was quite um, illuminating for some of us because of the arguments that they used, you know, linking it to such a sensitive issue, but that we all that we can all understand. There's times in history where when some people need to hide for the right reasons. Are we creating the infrastructure that will stop them from doing that? And is that what we want as a society? More recently, the city of London installed um, what they call smart uh, smart trash cans. These are bins trash cans that can read your phone information, can follow you around, can see how people use public space. These were installed in the city center. It was a partnership with a private company. Initially, no one said anything, but then one day, the media got word of this and published it on the, first, uh, on the, on the front page, saying you're being spied as you walk down the city center. And people said, well, I'm not happy about that. How come I didn't know about this? How come I do not know that there's someone who can trace the speed at which I walk, whether I'm entering this shop every single day or every two hours or every week? How come they're making uh, patterns out of the way that I use the city center? How, to, to what extent they can go when they enter my, uh, my mobile phone? No one had information on this. And so the system had to be removed. Again, like with full body scanners, the authorities lost face and the company lost money. So a huge warning sign again. Another British case of privacy by disaster. This woman, 17, was chosen to be the first youth commissioner in the, in the police, police, yeah, the police force, the local police force in, his home, in, in her hometown. 
Um, it was the first time that the police said, we need to hear the voice of the young, of young people. So we'll hire someone who's young, who can help us build links with the community and help us also understand the, the needs of young people. So she was the first ever appointed. This was supposed to be launched as a national program if this worked. She was appointed after going through a series of interviews because this was a paid job. This was actually a job. She was appointed and one week later, the media uncovered tweets that she had written when she was 14 that were ambiguous and that some people um, understood as being homophobic. And because of something she did when she was 14, she lost the job and the project was never launched. So again, a disaster that reminds us of the potential impact of technology in our daily lives, another privacy disaster. Or the case of Uber. When people realize that when Uber anonymizes data and puts it on a on a, um, a big da an open data platform, well, if you are not known by anyone, if you don't raise anyone's attention, that's totally fine. But if one if you're famous and one paparazzi gets a picture of you in one place and gets the plate of your of your Uber car, then goes to the website, they can identify where you took the cab and where the cab dropped you off. There's a student in the US who using anonymized open data by um, Uber could find out which of its clients were going to nightclubs up to three times a week. He did not reveal the names because he wanted to protect their privacy, but he could have done that. He managed to identify them. Why? Because when data is geolocated, it usually points to your home. If you leave the same place every day at 9 a.m., you leave in that place. So you're not anonymous anymore. They can hash your name, but that does not help to, uh, to protect your privacy. So another privacy disaster, and Uber's been under the, the weather because of their bad decisions in terms of data management. And finally, the case of in Bloom, which has sparked a debate in the US. This privacy by disaster, this privacy disaster is the reason why the US has a Student Privacy Act that is being debated right now. In Bloom was one of the first companies to offer free services to schools, um, cloud services to schools, to make sure that they could handle all the data that they're gathering, they could digitalize um, the information of their students, blah, blah, blah. Great service, massive help for schools that have no money and need to manage a lot of data. But then some parents started to ask, well, what are you going to do with this data? Like, you have information on the studies of my kids since they were, since they were very young. How do you protect that data? And in Bloom, instead of answering and putting in place privacy enhancing technologies got defensive and they did not have an answer for many of the questions that um, the parents had. So in Bloom there was one of the most promising educational companies, uh, the educational startups in the last three years went bankrupt. It disappeared because of privacy concerns. So again the industry realizing that this is that this is quite serious. And the reason why I'm telling you all this is because I think that this is the underlying story behind what's happening in Europe. It's accumulation of disasters that make people realize that this is not just a minor thing that they may or may not have to take into account. People are realizing that privacy breaches have really serious implications on their daily lives. And it is time for the authorities and for the industry and for citizens to realize that we cannot continue to ignore this. We cannot continue to treat data as just this thing that we create but that we, do, we really don't end up, we, don't, we really, really don't care where it ends up because as many people say, privacy is that thing that you don't know what it is until it's taken away from you. But also, you might not care about your privacy today, but you do not know who you want to be tomorrow. And tomorrow, you might care about what you did before. So if I go out tonight and part, partly and party really wild, I might not care if that goes online. But in 10 years' time, I might be a newborn Christian, or I might want to change my life. I don't want to be chased by the memory of who I was, and I should have the right to reinvent myself if I so wish. So these are the problems that we're facing and I wanted to devote the second part and I'm going to try to be very short of my presentation to solutions because I, I didn't want to leave you with the impression of oh my god there's all these things happening what do we do this is too scary. What we do at, at Ethicus basically I was working on, on surveillance when all this was happening and so all of a sudden I felt myself being sucked in to this debate working with the with the commission, taking part in lots of panels and, and debates and, and closed and open sessions on what can we do. And out of this, we created a company, um, which was originally a university spin-off, now we're independent, that tries, that tries to look and tries to improve the social societal impact of technologies. What we do, 
is we look at the desirability, acceptability, the ethics and the data management in any new technological development, a policy or a process. It can be, it can be anything. So what do we do? First, we map the data cycle from data collection to data deletion. We identify all the spots and we identify the weak spots in terms of data protection so that our clients and the people that we work with realize what happens to the data that they work with and what, what it goes through. We identify when contracts need to be signed, when there's um, data leakage, when they're sharing data uh, illegally, what forms they need to put in place, what are the key moments in terms of privacy of the data. And then on the basis of this, we look at acceptability, desirability, ethics and data management in relation to a, a series of keywords, values that we deem are important. We have a series of um, tools that we use from surveys to focus groups to quasi-experiments, simulation, cost-benefit analysis, basically. We use any um, methodology of the social sciences that we find adequate to assess what is the impact on legal, ethical and, um, and social issues of any new technology that is data-intensive. Just so that you get an idea, this is a structure that we work for in one of our biggest projects on border management. We work a lot on border management because the EU wants to introduce the Smart, Smart Border Initiative. It's basically an initiative to technologize all borders, to, um, to make sure that everyone you enter, every time you enter and leave the EU there is a digital trace and that it's easier to identify visa overstayers or those that want to enter the country unlawfully. And we've been asked to give an opinion on that and to help technologies design better, better technologies for that. And we found really interesting things, like when you, when you land somewhere at an airport, you realize there's always two queues, right? One for nationals um, and one for internationals, right? Do you know what that, why that is? Have you ever thought, how come I have this queue? Because your queue is not, it's never the shorter, <laughs> like, you know? You all have, have to queue up for a long time, so there, does, there doesn't seem to be any reasoning behind that. But when we started working on border management a long time ago, we realized that this is one of the moments when you realize what our constitutions say. Our constitutions across the world, in Brazil, in Spain, in the US, everywhere, give rights to nationals and do not give rights to non-nationals. Therefore, when you enter your country, you have rights. When you enter the country of somebody else, you have no rights. So when I enter Spain, I have a right to enter my country even if I'm a pedophile. I still keep the right to enter my space of jurisdiction. They might have to put me on trial afterwards, but entering my country is something that I should always be able to do. If you're a foreigner with a criminal record, that may not be the case. So when you're a foreigner, when they take your passport, they actually check it against databases. When they take my passport, they're not allowed to check my identity on a database. They're not allowed to do it on a regular basis. So we started to see all those things that are in the Schengen Border Code that are really fascinating, that, that stem from years and decades and centuries of defining what citizenship is and means. And now we have to translate this into the machines that will control citizens in this Smart Borders Initiative. How do we build these legal resources and legal understanding of what constitutes citizenship into the machine that reads your data and exchanges your data with other devices. This is the main challenge that we have at the moment. How do we translate societal concerns into the technology? How do we develop privacy-enhancing technology? How do we develop technologies that actually serve people and not, the, and not the other way around? And because I think I've gone over my time, I think I'm going to stop it here. I hope this was interesting. I've gone very quickly through a lot of very complex things, telling you about the debate in the EU about the work that we do and how we do it, and about the case of uh, border crossing, which I think is fascinating. Um, I'm around for questions or anything you might have, but I don't want to steal more, people, more, more time from the, from the colleagues that go after me. So thank you so much. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. And always, I always like presentations full of pictures. It makes me happier. So thank you for that. It was long. Uh, and now we are going to listen to Florian, who comes from France and Canada, both from Canada. I'm French on paper. You're on camera. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Being recorded. Yeah. I know. Ten years from now. 
And thank you, Mr. Diaz, for coming and for your presentation. Now the microphone is yours. Thank you. So, hello, my name is it's Florian Martin Barito. Well, so I'm French on paper, but still, um, I live in Montreal, in Canada. I'm a PhD in law candidate, both in France and in Canada, in uh, IP and IT law. I'm also a lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the University of Montreal and at the Department of Computer Sciences. Well, so basically, I'm kind of a lawyer and also. <laughs> But I am nice, huh? and um, I'm also a developer, like from since I'm six. So tonight I'm gonna present technologies for democracy and technologies for law to make law and to give people access to the law. So um, basically, in 15 minutes ish. Um, how can ICTs bring back democracy and power to citizens? Some have argued that thanks to the ICTs, direct democracy could um, come back to citizens, but ICTs can give back the power to citizens. For example, you, we have um, open government through ICTs, and this can bring back transparency and accountability and therefore trust to citizens and constituents. But tonight I will focus on law. Uh, last fall I published a paper, The Matrix of Law, in which I analyzed the paradigm shift of lawmaking processes since the advent of information society, since Gutenberg to, from Gutenberg to Wikipedia. And I propose the wiki state of mind as the next model for regulation and or for regulation in a networked society. And of course, Brazil is a very interesting country for that matter because well here we have a long you have a long history of public participation and you are the forefront of using ICT for lawmaking, like for Marcos the internet. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it right. <laughs> I'm trying so. So tonight I would like to raise, discuss three issues. The first one, public participation as marketing. The second one, the start of the art platform for lawmaking. What should be, what could be the best lawmaking platform? And I will finish with what is for me as a legal scholar one of the more important issues of democracy and justice access to law and legal knowledge for citizens, for everyday citizens. So, first, public participation as marketing, especially in Brazil. So, Regarding law, I argue that one of the most main issue of modern days, of modern law, is that uh, today regulation is a marketing tool for politics. We have an issue, a disaster, like for privacy, and then, oh, we're going to make a law. Yeah, our citizens will be happy and we will win the next election. So no, today lawmaking no akin to marketing. To be a fresh product, you have to propose new bits. And Brazil is also a very good example because today it seems like you have 18,000 bills currently being discussed in the apps. That's a lot of bills. So yeah, marketing. But you have also an explosion of public participation. You have basically public participation for everything and a platform by everyone. We went like last week, we went to visit stakeholders in Sao Paulo, in Brasilia, and 
everyone at the platform. Between photos, it starts to be a joke. Okay, so what is your platform? <laughs> Which one? So uh, that's an issue. It's good to have public consultation and color making, but maybe there is too much. And well, you have platform by everyone, but also like for the government, you had three different consultation for net neutrality. One by the Ministry of Justice, one by CGI, one by Anita. The three should work together to produce one single regulation. Should then they should work together, not okay, that's my public participation, that's yours and yours and well we will see what we can do. Also divide the the time for citizen if you want citizen to participate you should facilitate the work and uh, so maybe that we should have one platform for the government for every every branch of the executive power and one platform for the chambers and also public participation as marketing that's very nice but most of the time it's not color making we are like, okay, we are asking you to build the law together now. Most of the time, it's just consultation, open consultation, and that's good. That's not new. Like in Brazil, it has been done for years, for decades, even for centuries. But, so, it's good, it's open, and in some state that could have some corruption, not naming any state, but it's nice to, so you can see who think what and who won. Still, not that good. And so, most of the time we say this is so this is a consultation, but well, it's not binding. Like for Anatel or CGI, we're consulting the government. Then we will do what the board want to do. So, I think that's an issue uh, miscommunication to citizens. First point. Then, regarding lawmaking. So, what is lawmaking? Co lawmaking. It's basically you draft a bill altogether. That's what has been done for Macrosilu and for the uh, GPR, with the lawmaking process just ended like last week, I think, so for the data protection legislation. Today we have, I think there is like three major platforms in Brazil, Wikileaks by the house. Um, the legal text edit in um, Patsipacao, the platform of the Ministry of Justice, and a private initiative called Legislando by an um, NGO which is, I forgot the name, see. So, uh, <coughs> for each section, you can, like, the best one I think is Wikileaks, because this is really co-making for each section. You can argue new points, you can propose amendments. This is color making, it's not like a vague question, what do you think of that, and who will decide. But for me, what could be the perfect lawmaking platform is a GitHub-like platform. So, if there is some developers in the room, they will know what I'm talking about. So, GitHub basically it's a platform for open source development. You proposed, well, you have the main source codes, and then everyone in the community can propose new edits. So, you propose new edits, people can discuss it. Some people not very um, not very good at coding can just can just raise flag for new issues and the community will discuss it. Some people will discuss new amendment. The community will once again discuss it. We can merge amendments. You know, like in the house in any parliament. So that's what the platform exists for coding. Maybe we could do the same for democracy, and this will be a real co-making well, yeah, co of the law and yeah, that's it, github 
follow basically. I don't know that I don't have so much time. So um, GitHub follow. But so now we have a lot of platform for public participation, for color making. We just, uh, we just have one major issue. If we want an effective collaborative lawmaking process or even public, public consultation or even a justice system, we must have access to law for citizens. If we want an informed democracy, we should democratize the access to law and its understanding by citizens. This is not just important for color making, this is important for society. Because there is a legal adage that says that no one should ignore the law. Or in common law, that ignorance, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you have to know everything. And basically that's it. And so I think that it's our duty, or my duty, as a legal scholar, to help citizens to know the law, to know the rights. And there is an asymmetry of information between citizens and other stakeholders. And now I'm just, I'm not just talking of citizens one side and lawyers the other side, I'm also speaking of citizens against companies, or citizens versus the government. So access to law generally is understood as access to the legal text and to CARES law, but come on. Even for lawyers, and even just to the macro view, section 19, <laughs> come on. You cannot get it just by reading it. Uh, well, I didn't get it at least. Uh, I have a lot of, s no, no, just not section 19. So, uh, how do you, understand so say that this is access to the law and this is a free access law movement so today we have our laws and our case law online nice but to understand the law you have to give a comprehensive access to the citizen that's meant for every section you need to have definition of key concepts um, the over section of the law that you need to understand this one with the major case law explaining this, but also not a 100 page case law like an abstract with key points, you need to have you know, definition, blah blah blah, a lot of stuff that does not exist. Well, until three years ago, but so this is for me what is and what should be access to law and what sh should government build. I have did that, we have did that um, at Montreal. I'm managing a project called OpenOM, which the main focus is to give people access to law and legal scholarship. And uh, basically this is the idea of Wikipedia. Once again, the wiki. You know in Wikipedia, you should for something, you have the page, then you have links, and if you want more information of this concept, you click on it, you have the full information, you have the um, reflex box on the side with key points, key links. This, this way you can understand things. So, I'm gonna, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just show you one screenshot. Basically, we have, no. <laughs> Uh, we, with the uh, help of the Ministry of Justice of Quebec, the Quebec Board, um, we did that with uh, the name in English is An Act to Establish a Legal Framework for Information Technology. It's kind of a macro view there in general, but for Quebec. So for every uh, section of the law, you have a text. Um, a summary of why we have this text. What does that mean? Article, links, definition of every key concept. And 
everything has been um, written by law professors, but in a way that everyone can understand. Uh, you have the um, key uh, case law and also key um, law papers. So the law papers are more like for lawyers, but still. Uh, we are negotiating with some publisher to put online the PDF for the HTML version of the paper. And also we have blogging. So blogging is not a legal text, it's like one or two page explaining key points of the law. So this was, this law is more for lawyers, but currently we are building uh, the same thing with the consumer protection. Because in Quebec, uh, if you have a claim under $7,000, you can go by yourself to court without any lawyers. But if you want to do that, you need to understand the law to understand the rights. So we are building this with the help of um, a major public publisher, a publicly owned publisher, Sokish. So yeah, they give us the uh, abstract of every important case law. So we have 100, 100 once, uh, once again, it's like 100 page decision, but like summarizing one page with key points, definitions, blogging by students. So yeah, basically this is for me access to law, access in a comprehensive way for citizens to yeah, this time to get to access to justice, but also if you want them to participate in the big debate, they have to understand what they do. And you cannot just say, well, you don't get it, step aside, because if so, you have to say the same thing with congressmen regarding technology issues. Well, maybe it could be a good thing for democracy, but still, thank you. Thank you for your time, and I'm sorry. Thank you, Florian. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we will have our last uh, fellow talking today. It is Kahiman, who is also French and also comes from Canada. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we have the, the pleasure to listen to Kahiman now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Well, uh, so with me ends everything. So I'm going to speak. <laughs> I'm going to speak of uh, cyber war. First of all, I want to thank uh, IGS uh, for allowing me to be a pro this year and uh, being a visiting fellow. It's it was wonderful, and I want to thank you again. Uh, so yes, I'm a PhD candidate in Montreal and Paris. Um, it's co-directed. And uh, my expertise is a legal expertise in international public law, human rights, and very specifically on um, humanitarian international law, which is mainly known as the law of war. I'm going to talk today about cyber war. As you can see, you have the cyber and the war crossed. Because cyber is something very sexy, very fashion, that we can see everywhere even on cleaning computer space, cyber clean. Well, does it mean something? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to explain you my, my vision of cyber war and, uh, and with my eyes of humanitarian lawyer. First of all, I want to ask if you know what's the common point in the screen? One TV show and two movies. Die Hard 4, Die Free or Die, Skyfall, 24 last season. Nobody knows the common point. All started with a cyber attack. Okay? Yes. So everything started by a cyber attack in these movies, but in the real world, we have no James Bond, no lightning 
I don't remember his name. I know <laughs> Jack Bauer. There is no such kind of people. But I want to explain how ICTs can have a dark side, actually, in the governmental matters, in the main matters, because we are speaking of privacy, which actually is something everybody is starting to know because it's touching every day's life. But cyber war, nobody knows about, except that everybody, every media is talking about it, like it's something happening. It's something happening, but it's not a cyber war. And I want to ask also another question. Do you know where internet has been born? Which is, which is the genesis of internet. It's a military one. It has been born in a military field framework. Well, we can discuss that with him, but I, I want to, I, there is a lot of things, but the, it was a talk. Some people said it's Euro, from Europe, some people say it's from um, United States, but anyway. The thing is, their original genesis of it, it's military. It was not designed to be the internet that we know to, today. It was designed to be a communication uh, tool, internal, internal military communication tool. Network, to be exact. It was born in the 60s. With, and um, it started with the first uh, network called ARPANET. But my point is that it was military. And it says something I need you to get. It's the military part of the internet. We cannot separate this. Okay. So now we are talking about the terminology. Cyber terminology has been born in the fiction. If you have read that book, which is written weird, but the Neuromancer is the first time that we started to hear from cyber. Cyberspace, it's the one of the quote I, hear, I put here. Um, but it's, it started this way to talk about cyber. Now we see cyber everywhere, even in cleaning things. Well, uh, cyber has a very special meaning, and if some people know a bit of Greek, it comes from Greek Cooper. Cooper in Greek is Govan. Governing, Cooper, there is a lot of words with Cooper, but you have government, uh, governing, and everything like that. So, my point is how could you govern war in itself? Cyber war is something, it, it emerged because it's sexy, it's, it's scary. Everybody started to wonder what it is. I understand that something is happening, but it's not cyber war. Because war is a very specific concept. And when, you start, when, you start, when I start researching on cyber war, I started also researching about war on term, in terms of strategy and theory of war. And there is one thing I learned, is that war is something that has to be violent, brings moral force, and to, have to be a collective political decision. But the violence is it's simply a bloody fight. Uh, soldiers against soldiers, soldiers against civilians. It has to be violent, it has to be physical to get the war. So cyber war is not is something which, which doesn't exist in, and cannot be. But in the meantime, we, we enter a new kind of confrontations. A new kind where a lot of players, a new game where a lot of kind of players, public governments, it's private sectors, civil society, activist group, a lot of terrorists also, a lot of them is playing the same game which is happening on cyberspace. But as a humanitarian lawyer, I was wondering if someone knows about law of war, it's simple. It's all the rules that um, tell us how to make war or how not to make war. You cannot kill children, you cannot kill, um, you cannot use specific weapons that make too much damages for what it costs. But how do we implement that on cyberspace? 
Well, I don't know yet. But it's something I was wondering. But the one thing I know is that we enter that new era of the of confrontation between states, non-actors, non-private, non-public actors, terrorist groups, activist group, whatever. That mean that needs to think about how what's happening on cyberspace. And to give you some example, because it can actually lead to war, to real war, I'm going to talk about pre-famous cyber attack. Do you know what happened in Estonia in 2007? No? Okay. So you have to context it. I, I'm going to context it first. In Estonia, you have to know that Estonia is one of the countries that, are, that is actually 95% connected to the network. Every, every, almost every services from Estonia are online. And in 2007, the government from Estonia decided to remove a statute, a, a Soviet statute, from the main place of the main city. The day after, they were under a cyber attack, a DDoS, denial of service cyber attack, which blocked for 48 hours all the services online. No ministry website, no banks, no banks outside. Everything stopped. But when you're almost 100% connected, I mean, I don't think that one of us can be 48 hours without being connected. That's what happened in Estonia. And in the Estonian government asked actually, because they blamed the Russian government, to implement the first article of the North Atlantic Treaty, which is the collective military response. Well, the NATO say, oh my god, no, no way, we're not going there. But you know what? To calm you down, we're gonna create the Cyber Defense Research Center of Excellence of NATO, which is now in Estonia, Italian. So it was a diplomatic response, but to prevent a war. In 2008, uh, it's the Georgian government that been under a cyber attack, also Russian, and uh, the war also started just after that. Some people say that the cyber attack was the genesis of the war. Some say that no, it was just an attack during the war. But anyway, uh, who knows what the, the Stuxnet? Sorry, do you know? No. Do you want to answer? No. no? <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's a malware. Um, a malware uh, sent it that um, attacks a nuclear an Iranian nuclear facility. So it was simply to sabotage the this facility. Some people say that if the the damages could be very 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 harming because it's a nuclear facility. And the malware uh, actually accelerate uh, the tube reactors. And if some said that if the Iranian agent haven't seen it in time, maybe it can implode or explode and uh, cause a, a nuclear environment damage, a big catastrophe, a big disaster. And do you know what happened in Saudi Amco, a southern uh, company? So they actually, they were under, uh, in 2010, a cyber attack. It was a malware also. And this one was pretty impressive because the malware destroyed the whole um, computers. When I say destroy, it's not only the network, it's the computer itself. They explode. They just exploded. So, all their data, all the computers, they have to change everything, they have to recover everything. But all these cases didn't lead to war. But what I'm trying to say, if it's leading to war, what's happening? This new era of confrontation is something we're dealing with, with cyber sabotage, cyber surveillance, cyber espionage, cyber... There is a lot of it. We, we are not aware of it because it's something happening way upon us, but it's happening. And as a humanitarian lawyer, and I know that the, that the damages are not the same as, a as in a conventional war, but it's something happening 
that we cannot ignore, and as a humanitarian lawyer, my question is, do you think that we can rule cyber war? So, I think I'm in time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Now we are open to questions and the three are here so they can answer and uh, uh, after we end our session of questions and answers don't go because we have a very small surprise for you, okay? It's a good surprise, of course. I won't invite you to stay if I had a bad surprise, of course. It's a good surprise, so don't be afraid. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, I, I think I have to take the, the microphone to you or to the middle of the way, but it gets to you. So because we're recording. Yes. Hi, I have a question for Gemma and also for the public here for, to bring your conversation to the Brazilian context. Um, I was very interested in many things that you talked about, but at the, the beginning of your talk you talked about full body scanners. Um, and I just went to um, a very polemic, a polemic uh, public debate two weeks ago in Minas Gerais where they were, um, it's a very different context, but they were talking about full body scanners in the context of prisons. Because in Minas Gerais, they do um, full body checks on women. And it's a very invasive process. It's, the debates of the experts suggest that by doing a full body check on women, it does not necessarily make a difference in terms of safety in prisons. And so they're trying to implement a full body scanner in prisons. And I'm wondering, so it's a bit different. It's an interesting slant on the question of security and privacy in a very different context. But I am wondering if you, if your, if etica, etica, if they, if you by chance study this in the context of prisons, because now it's, it's, it changes the scope of a lot of the um, questions you had on um, that, and how you analyze policy when it comes to privacy and public um, technologies. And of course, I welcome the Brazilian public here if they have anything to say about that. I don't know if it's happening in Rio as well, but I know it's a very polemic issue in the country. So. Thank you for the question. It's Gemma, to answer first. This is a debate with, we've had for a long time with surveillance technologies because surveillance can also have a, a, a good impact on people. Um, um, being recognized by the state in some countries where you take that for granted can mean surveillance, but in countries where you're not even recognized, like in the favelas in Rio, being recognized by the state, having, having an ID can be uh, a way to access the welfare state, etc. So we've had these debates for a long, long time. I think it, it all comes down to saying that it's not about the technology. It's about where we put it in. And it's about how we take into account the needs and expectations of those that are going to use it. So are full body scanners bad or good? I don't know. What I do know is that in the case of Europe, they were not responding to an identified actual problem. They caused more vulnerability for uh, travelers, and people felt they did not have a choice. So if in another setting you do count with the opinions of people, if the, the, the decision to implement them because they're less invasive is a shared decision, and you make sure we have enough data security and data privacy mechanisms to make sure that the data is never stored, and therefore it cannot be hacked, then the same technology that is evil in European airports can become a source of good in other environments, but it is all about the process. That's why when we, when we work with, the, with governments and companies, we always say, we are here to help you do what it is that you want to do, but do it better. So we do not want to say no, even though sometimes we have to. But that's not our main goal. We want to help them understand why people may have issues with the things that they're developing. And sometimes these issues have to do with the law. Lots of technologies are illegal. Consider drones, for instance, that have been flying without a legal framework for a long time and causing damages and casualties um, out of the uh, legal um, scope. But also acceptability issues. And, that's, and I think that's what the industry is reacting to. They're realizing that even if things are legal, if people don't like them, they don't have a business model. Or they may even lose face and they may even lose the trust of their, of their, um, of their potential customers or existing customers. So we see there's a slightly a change of 
attitude. And so the, the answer is, okay, so you want to in introduce this new technology in this place. Let's look at what their stakeholders for this are. Let's work with them. Let's see what it is that they need. And on the basis of that, let's find a technology that makes life better for everybody and not just for one sector. In the case of the airports, this was supposed to make life better for the, for the um, border crossing guards. It didn't really, it was mostly about the security theater, but you gotta make sure that you're working with those that are gonna be the, at the receiving end of the, of the technology. So it's always, is technology neutral? No. But is it installed in a neutral world, in neutral settings? No. <laughs> so how do we work with that? And that's what we, and we found that all the methodologies of the social sciences to be incredibly useful. Focus groups, experiments, um, analysis, interviews, so people say that, that the humanities are doomed in a technological society. I think they're more needed than ever because those that are developing the technology don't have the tools to assess what, how society reacts to new developments. Another question? Kathy. It's much longer now. Oh, no, no, we can just... No. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I haven't seen you. Well, I actually have two questions, one from Florian and another for Karima. Um, from Florian, I want to know, um, I think it's amazing the idea of creating platforms to discuss law with general people, you know, people that's not inside this environment. But uh, I want to know if that is a challenge for you and like this kind of research, um, the language that sometimes can, you know, block the understanding of these rights. So how can people who never, you know, heard about some specific terms that it's specific from the law language can discuss things that are actually affecting their lives and how do you deal with this kind of challenge? And to Karima, it's something that I was uh, thinking about when you're saying that um, we don't have exactly a cyber war and th this must be something physical, and you need to have violence. I was just um, remembering something I read this week about uh, the ISIS. So, okay, they use a lot of social networking, uh, social uh, media to uh, gather their soldiers to do real war, and they are focusing on new, the new generation that was actually born under the technology time. So, I don't know, we, do you ever consider, or um, when you talk about uh, cyber war, do you consider this kind of use of technology to really promote real war or it's like something really crazy to think about? Thank you. Um, we question regard the uh, lawmaking or access to law? Uh, the lawmaking, the, the uh, collaborative uh, platforms yeah, to yeah. discuss. Yeah, yeah but, but maybe the issue because Still, we need the law to be uh, legal knowledge. It's very technical, yeah. and so we, you need to have specific words because each word, word has a meaning. Like Brazilian and legal Brazilian, it's the same language, but at the same time, it's two different language. Um, but actually, you know, that's the same for uh, coding. When you code in PHP or Java, no, no Java, I don't like Java, and actually e democracy e is currently coded in Java, but they're changing it. So PHP, uh, Ruby, whatever. This is basically in English, but it's a specific English, you know, so you have coders knowing this language, and non-coders not knowing it. Still, you can propose something, then expert will go after you and say, you know, for this to work, you have to use this word, and uh, or just if you don't want to propose the exact line code, just you raise a flag, an issue, uh, a bug, like, well, maybe we should do this way, what do you think, and that's the power of community community, you know, it's collaborative, so everyone can help each other. I think that could be, uh, it's kind of an utopia, I know, but because yesterday we were speaking, talking of inclusion, then 
who can access to this kind of platform, but still, it could be, it will ever be better than what we have today. So, who can join? Mm -hmm. uh, so, thank you, this is a great question. Um, when I started my PhD program, I was naive and I thought that I could pick up all what you spoke. Um, and the thing about what you said is something happening actually the use of social media for propaganda and uh, for recruitment but uh, there is studies start starting about that subject but I had to focus because I was uh, interested really on the law of war and how to implement it so I focused my research on the military use of ICTs so um, in terms of military, that's why actually I start talking about cyber war because in terms of military uh, meaning it doesn't mean nothing so um, that's uh, the real word. but I know that uh, there is research uh, happening about that so the, the role of the social media even in um, terrorism propaganda or uh, uh, democracy installments and all of this um, what's happening right now Kathy? Help you like to <laughs> it's okay, we can reach consensus in the middle ground from your side and my side. Uh, so, two quick questions. Uh, for Gemma, uh, it's sort of a, like a side question to the discussion that you brought about uh, privacy, that protection, and privacy by disaster, which is the discussion on right to be forgotten in Europe since you have mentioned a lot, especially in the end of your talk, about uh, creating this environment to protect the, data, the personal data of everyone else. So it would be great to hear your opinion about the current status of Right Be Forgotten in, in Europe. And for Karima, as I understand right now, we need to use the French accents to mention your name here in the ITS. So uh, I hope I'm doing this right. Uh, so. One question for you will be, uh, in the whole discussion about cyber war, what are the, the role of... Uh, we are quite aware of governments, but how do you see corporations, uh, companies, uh, plugging in into the debate of uh, cyber security and cyber war, especially because recently we have all discussions regarding the leaks of the Sony emails, at the same time we have uh, a lot of corporate interest in creating a whole fuss on one's, one or another issue regarding this whole cyber war thing. So it would be interesting to have your opinion on what are the role of uh, companies in this, this whole discussion. So those will, those will be my two questions. Thank you, Carlos, for asking. Jennifer, please. I understand this is a very controversial question and probably require a whole session just for it. Um, what I, I don't think the right to be forgotten is perfect, but I cannot imagine and I will not accept a society where memory is mandatory. I think that it is, that is the end of civilization as we know it. I think we all benefit from the fact that things can be forgotten and that things that we've done in the past don't have to show up in our record every single day. Um, so we need to find a solution for that, and at least for the ones we digitalize something, we create um, a, a record that may not disappear ever, and that we have no control of. So having that, creating um, a mechanism by which when you feel that one of those records is seriously harming your life opportunities, having that channel right now, I think it's we, we need it as a society. I think it's, it can be imperfect. However, um, Google um, leaked or it was hacked just last week, I think, um, in Spain. And the data, the statistics on the right to be forgotten in Spain was, was leaked. And there's a bunch of um, diagrams on the internet showing the categories of people that have applied for the right to be forgotten in Spain. It's quite interesting because there's a lot of talk about, oh, but will a, um, a, a terrorist or a, poli a corrupt politician um, ask for the record of their wrongdoing to be removed? 
And actually, when you look at the data, like 99% of the people that request right to be forgotten is for personal reasons, because they want to find a job, and they don't want that accident that they had when they were 16 to be the first thing that comes up in a Google search. So I think that it's the best solution at, right now. But one of the problems that we have is that we, we have not yet created the social consensuses that we need around data. Um, we have the social contract, which we don't really respect, but, um, but I think we need a data contract. I often talk about the car, and I make an analogy that I think it's very easy to understand. When the car was created, when someone invent, invented engines and cars, that was great. Like, all of a sudden you could go from A to B in no time. The possibilities it opened were magnificent. Like, in the medieval ages, to go from Barcelona to Girona was a week of, on a horse. Uh, right now you do it in an hour on, on a plane. Uh, you do it by car, it's also an hour. It's like, the possibilities were incredible. But society soon realized that those possibilities came with some negative externalities. Cars could kill people. Cars could go too far, too fast. People could lose, lose control of their cars. They polluted. And so we forced the, data make, the car makers um, to install speed limits in the cars, to install seat belts. These are expensive. Like, a car maker would probably rather just create a car that can go at a thousand miles per hour. Um, technologies were certainly preferred to make cars that can go as fast as they can with no limitations. That's what they say with data. But if I can collect the data, why should I limit that? Well, you can run at a million miles per hour, and you shouldn't do that. Because we've created the social consensuses that allow for society and cars to coexist. The problem with data intensive technologies, we still don't have those consensus. The only thing we have so far is the right to be forgotten. So I think it's the good beginning. It's, it's a good beginning to a conversation that we need to have urgently. And we need more tools and better tools in the future that can gear us towards this new data contract that enables society and technology to coexist in a fruitful way. Um, on my part, it's uh, going to be simple. If I well, if I wouldn't take uh, into consideration the place of corporations and companies, I would be ignorant and naive, and I won't get, I will not get uh, the complexity of uh, of all of this cyber war thing. Uh, and in fact, it's simple to know that a lot of cyber security thing matters and cyber defense matters are actually under uh, private sector hands. So um, the private sector is very major in that conversation, in that discussion. So, and actually, they are invite, invite, invent, invited uh, in this discussion, even in the international um, telecommunication union. Is that the, well? Um, <laughs> uh, they are invited to discuss all these matters. And for me, um, more interesting than of their work, the thing is it's very hard to get to them, to get to know what, how they deal with it. And uh, they place with, uh, upon the discussion with the military side, because even the military side, I'm telling, it's very hard to get their opinion. So um, the discussion on cybersecurity uh, involving the private sector is something I want it. And uh, mostly because there is also a question of, of governance. Uh, and I need to be aware of it, but it's very hard and it's very complex to get in it. Because there are new players and as I know as a humanitarian lawyer, I have this is where I'm, I'm going actually. The law of war is not adapted to what's happening right now. And we have to rethink a lot of things. And for example, the place of the private sector. Okay, any other question? No? You're just curious about the surprise, is that so? Yeah? No more questions, you want? No more questions? No? Uh, well, the surprise is this. Uh, we have here Jean Philippe, and Jean Philippe uh, plays musical instruments and he, he plays them very well. And he was supposed to play yesterday because one of our fellows is a researcher and a singer, but she's not feeling well. She was not feeling well yesterday, so she could not come. 
but we still want to have the opportunity to listen to João Felipe, and it would be very disappointing if we could not listen to him and if he could not play to us. So João Felipe is going to play uh, some uh, song, some music. I don't know uh, how many songs he's going to play, but he's playing some four or five songs. Okay, so we'll have some minutes here to listen to João Felipe, and, and after we have some food here for you. Okay, so enjoy. Thank you. Obrigado, João, por vir. Thank you very much, and hope you like it. I'm sure you will. Thank you. 